uh, I'm the director of the Inter-University Center for Terrorism Studies. Actually, we were waiting for the Al Jazeera television. They got in touch uh, with us that they were planning to come uh, to uh, tape the uh, discussion. But uh, we're not going to wait any longer. There are so many attractions uh, in, in Washington that uh, you cannot miss. Some are more, more exci exciting than uh, others. So as, uh, as moderator, I would like to, to begin, and whoever comes will come and uh, join us. Um, I think we distributed some materials about this specific uh, event. As uh, you know, the title is Can the State System and Separatism uh, Coexist? Uh, all of us uh, read the papers and we follow what's happening with the current um, events and uh, trends of uh, separatism, uh, some in the name of uh, self-determination or justice, or right, or God, or whatever it is. Obviously, uh, <coughs> we know very well that many of the uh, challenges, they uh, actually um, uh, present uh, some security concerns on the national, regional, global level, and so on and so forth. So fundamentally, <laughs> the bottom line about this uh, discussion uh, whether separatism in any dress mm. that, you, that you wish, um, whether you deal with uh, protests or demonstrations or civil obedience, disobedience, sometimes obedience, and um, violence, terrorism, uh, even war. Uh, obviously, we are familiar with that for a very long time. So the question is whether this ethnic or racial or religious or cultural linguistic uh, groups will contribute in um, the coming months and years for more security, more stability, or for chaos, uh, violence, uh, and war. And um, we are ready to move on with the academic a panel of experts with um, very rich background. You, you do have the, um, I think, the bios, so I won't go into details, but let me uh, first uh, <coughs> introduce them uh, briefly and uh, begin with uh, the dialogue here. Um, our first uh, panelist, uh, will be Professor David Cunning, um, who is an uh, adjunct professor of European Studies at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins uh, University. And uh, he retired a number of years ago after uh, 30 years as senior analyst at the CIA. Um, he was a founding member, I understand, of the CIA uh, Red Cell. It has nothing to do with the investigations now in Russia. So if he wants to talk about that, he's uh, welcome. At any rate, from the academic point of view, um, he has a PhD at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And academically, we always cooperate um, on some of these uh, projects with the Fletcher School and the Johns Hopkins and so on. So welcome, and you would begin in a while. Okay, <coughs> um, unfortunately, our second speaker, uh, <coughs> Dr. Jean Abien from the Cameroon, um, he is stuck in the Cameroon because of a problem with the flight to the U.S. 
I don't know exactly what happened, but he just sent me an email, he apologized. He was planning to come and to speak on the situation uh, related to uh, Africa, and uh, we will have an opportunity to uh, raise that question. So I regret this uh, very much. Uh, our if that's the case, uh, <coughs> we'll have, I think, uh, Fernando Jimenez, if I'm not mistaken, you will be the next one. Um, and um, I'm sure many of you know who Dr. Jimenez is, and he spoke before at quite a number of our events. He's a attorney, a lawyer. We're not against it, but um, at any rate, more importantly, is a true academic and uh, colleague and friend, and uh, we dealt with the issue of uh, the Basque and the ETA for a very long time, and participated in many of our uh, activities and many, many of the missions. So it would deal with some of the issues related to uh, Catalonia and Spain in general, he was uh, a former governor of the Basque country, and you can read his uh, bio, as I said. We're delighted to have Dr. Hossein Ibish, who is a senior resident scholar of the Arab Gulf State Institute in uh, Washington. I'm sure many of you are familiar with his very prolific uh, uh, writings and uh, articles and the media appearances and uh, publications um, in uh, general. And I think uh, it, it can really deal with many of the issues that we're facing today uh, in, in the Middle East. And um, uh, as I try to indicate, uh, each one initially will make a, a short uh, opening remarks, and then we'll have a round table discussion uh, with, with the audience. So uh, welcome to, to our panel. Um, then, last but not least, did I miss someone? No, no. I th I'm not offended. <laughs> I did, you did, did me, but you haven't done. No, no, that's what, of course. <laughs> it's all right. Sorry? We can we can resolve it much easier than the problem of separatism. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Professor Marvin Weinbaum, who is uh, currently director of Afghanistan and Pakistan studies of the Middle East uh, Institute, um, he was a uh, professor, is now Professor Emeritus uh, of Political Science, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. And I think we, we met uh, uh, initially at Columbia University where he received his uh, PhD uh, in 1965, I believe, at the time. That's right. Uh, correct. <laughs> and uh, for many years, he served as director of program South Asian and Middle East Studies. Um, so that's basically the panel, and we'll see if some of my colleagues will uh, come a little bit uh, later on. Now, uh, just one one word about uh, the uh, academic uh, interest in this field, at least in my uh, limited uh, experience. I, I want to mention uh, actually two activities. One One activity uh, back in 1979, um, my colleagues in Europe, Germany, uh, and the Netherlands, and so on, we uh, organized a postgraduate uh, seminar. Uh, you wouldn't believe where, but it was in Yugoslavia at Dubrovnik at the time when Marshal Tito ran the show. and. Uh, it was interesting because we were concerned with uh, the collapse of some of the states at the time. And as all of us know, separatism triggers terrorism, and terrorism triggers uh, also separatism and so forth. 
so at any rate, we decided to have a, a um, actually a, a course open to students from all over the world to deal with some of these issues. So we were, had to be very careful about the title. We didn't call it uh, terror, the collapse of states of terrorism, but we called it uh, violence, how to, co to combat violence. And uh, the rest is uh, history. We know what happened in uh, Yugoslavia. The, um, the, uh, the other, uh, I, I think, uh, activity I want to mention that exactly, I thought I had a book here. Um, in 1980, my colleagues and I, we uh, organized research on self-determination, national, regional, and global dimensions. It was uh, published in 1980, and uh, the major topic, of course, was uh, whether separatism can advance the cause of peace and with justice or trigger war, and I won't tell you exactly what we concluded, but we'll have a chance to discuss it a little bit later on. Now, uh, as a participant, uh, observer um, of um, that academic uh, work um, and as moderator, I just want to make three points. One, about the historical lessons that we can learn uh, from yesterday, uh, the historical lessons we can learn from today, and the historical lessons that we can learn from tomorrow. And uh, by that, by that I, I mean specifically that um, if we go back in uh, history, um, the past century, 100 years ago, and uh, specifically, I want to uh, remind the uh, audience and our colleagues here that um, in 1914, as all of us know, the Archduke uh, Ferdinand, uh, he was assassinated in Sarajevo. And uh, as uh, many of you know, the uh, assassin actually was a member of a group, a secret Serbian nationalist movement, which was called the young uh, Bosnian and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, some groups, some cells uh, were trained um, at that time in Belgrade um, and uh, so on, um, how to, to use bombs and um, cyanide even and uh, pistol. And of course the assassin used the pistol and again the rest of uh, history uh, because at uh, that time, as you know, the uh, Ferdinand was uh, in uh, favor of giving equal voices to the Slavs of the empire. And uh, this uh, belief was contrary to the ideology of uh, Serbia. So this is uh, one, one example. This was yesterday, uh, so to speak, historically. Now today, Today is October 31, 1984. I don't know how many of you remember what happened uh, on October 31, 1984. Actually today, uh, obviously it's uh, 2017, but uh, at that time, the um, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated by Sikh bodyguards um, in connection with the conflict in the sub-Indian uh, uh, continent. Um, as um, I'm sure everybody knows that um, um, uh, Prime Minister Gandhi's uh, um, father uh, was um, um, the founder of the Indian state, Nero, and he wanted to forge uh, a nation of many different ethnic, religious, and cultural uh, factions at the time 
um, when, uh, of course, the sub uh, uh, Indian continent uh, was part of the British rule, and we're going to discuss this as well. So uh, we know that parti particular uh, history. Uh, finally, one more, one more, I think, um, historical lesson. Uh, again, uh, we're keeping, you know, a very close uh, calendar, and uh, exactly November 1, November 1, 1950. Uh, again, I don't know how many people remember that date. Um, tomorrow is going to be November 1, 2017. So at that time, November 1, 1950, uh, we had a attempt at assassination of President uh, Truman in Blair House. Uh, again, Puerto Rican um, nationalist extremists, and uh, fortunately they were uh, apprehended, although you can argue about the security in Blair House in general at that time, and in fact uh, one of them uh, was originally sentenced to die or to <coughs> Um, be killed, um, but the uh, uh, president, he commuted his sentence to life in prison. And you know, we can spend uh, not only uh, an hour, but a full semester to, to discuss uh, many of the issues involved, and hopefully they will emerge in our discussion uh, about um, the numerous uh, definitions related to separatism, self-determination, as I mentioned uh, before, whether it is civil disobedience or national liberation movements and so on. And uh, also what is very critical is to discuss the root causes of separatism, uh, whether we're dealing with the political uh, discontent going all the way to resistance um, and so on, or the cultural dimension, discontent in terms of discrimination or religious uh, intolerance and so on, or the economic uh, discontent, unfulfilled expectations. Um, those who believe that um, poverty um, triggers uh, violence, and there are those who believe that if uh, they are unable to um, gain from the richness of their region, uh, there are the losers. So again, we have to deal with the root causes. And finally, I do hope that we're going to discuss what are the options and the responses available to our societies on the national, regional, and global levels. So with this uh, very brief introduction, I would like to invite you to come up here first um, we're going to have a record of the discussion and bring it to a wider audience. Okay. Thank you, Professor Alexander, and I appreciate the Potomac Institute inviting me to take part in what is obviously a rather topical and important top topic. The question can be answered easily. Well, we started a little late, so I should just do a couple bullet points. Can they coexist? Of course, they always have. When has there been a time when somebody's not been trying to separate from something politically? And so, so you're not going to get to a period where the state exists, no one's trying to separate anywhere, everything's fine. There's always, there are, will always be movements where people living inside a state contested sovereignty mm -hmm. or people wanted to form a different state. Uh, I'll come back to some of the issues in, involved in this, but I just want to make the point, this is nothing new. And, we, and it, it, that we even asked the question, I think it's at a bigger issue that I'll come back to. Second, all the things going on in Europe right now, Catalonia, Brexit, whatever's going on in Northern Italy, take your pick, none of these are threats to the system itself. None of these various movements are trying to bring the whole thing down. The Catalans want their own state. They want to be in the system as a state, recognized, and of course they also want to be in the, in, in the European Union. The other movements in Europe, most of them don't even want to separate from the state, or if they do, they're stopping somewhere short of that. All of the European issues are not basic threats to the system, which after all the Europeans created. What they are a threat to are the creation myths that have built, been built up in Europe 
since it destroyed its power in the 20th century. Right? You have the, the, the European Union, the teleology of the European Union, of Europe setting itself up to say, once we were great and powerful, we created the state system, we did laws, everything else, we are powerful. Powerhouse of the planet was a term that Europeans used about themselves and about the little pimple off the nose of Asia they live in. Now, they no longer have that power. They lost it in, by 45 in the, world, in the world wars. Suddenly, Europe was simply, be, simply became a theater with giants on its flanks, much more powerful than the Europeans in a way that looked like that was sort of an irrevocable change. So the Europeans reacted as individuals do to a trauma and constructed a new reason to rationalize their importance. Once we were great and powerful, now we are wise and humane and just. We have lots of courts. We have chosen not to go to war anymore. We've learned our lesson. We have an international, we have a, a, a means of helping everybody else in the world learn from our mistakes. Therefore, just like before, you have to listen to us. The Catalan issue, Brexit, all of these things are threatening the teleology of the European Union, the creation myth by which there is only one way forward. We've gotten past war, past conflict. We've learned from our errors. We don't do violence anymore. Ethnic issues are not critical in Europe anymore. Who cares about the Island Islands or Oslo Lorraine or the Duchy of Teschen? The problem in Catalonia, as it was in Yugoslavia, which I don't have time to go into detail. We can maybe get into that um, in, in, in the uh, Q, Q and A's is that these conflicts, these difficulties, bring up the mythology and they, they sort of rub it bare a bit. Mm. It shows that the problems that used to exist still do. That there are people who don't like other people for racial or ethnic or whatever means. All the things the Europeans thought they were past, they are not past. Yeah. And this undermines this mythology that they have about themselves. This matters in the larger sense in that, and I only have a just, I can just throw this out, we can talk about it. The state system itself having been created by Europeans basically and imposed on the rest of the world, and then of course the United States as a transatlantic adjunct to Europe then becomes a part of the system and dominant in the system. All of that is under threat now. Mm -hmm. As the West declines, in my view, it, we are in structural decline. And so any conflicts like this bear on those larger questions and begin to get more existential than they would if you were just looking at kind of the facts involved. When you get out of Europe, then it's different. And I believe you're looking at differences in kind, not degree. When you get into societies where traditional notions of honor and family and other things not to do with the Weberian state structure or various, we have notion of rule of law, democracy, transparency, all these words we use to describe the things that we invent, that we've invented, that we like to think about ourselves and that we insist are universally applicable and create a world in which we remain dominant, when you get outside that world, things are different. So with Kurdistan, I would argue, it's not so much about a new state, it's about Mah uh, Masoud Barzani's miscalculation of what the United States was going to do and how if we, whether we could get away with what he tried to get away with, building on a series of successes he'd had in what used to be called Iraq, it'll still exist nominally, but that's, that's gone, uh, the successes he had vis-a-vis -vis the Talibanis and others, now he's miscalculated, very traditional, kind of, very traditional kind of issues among families, among patronage networks. And so, and globally, we see more of that than we do the traditional European sort of state teleology around constitutions and rule of law. All these things are used in the, in the, in the palaver, in the, um, uh, in the discussions, and they matter to an extent. But outside of the core area of the state system, it's a very different thing. And as the as the core state system itself sort of wobbles because its greatest powers are in decline and others are moving in to um, challenge them in ways that really have not happened before, I would argue. Those who are still managing the state system will find ways of explaining why it's really simple, still in the realist mode about states and structures and constitutions and, and the usual geopolitics of the state. And I, I want to just suggest to you that it's not that we are seeing basic systemic change, mm. that, the, that going forward, the state itself should not be thought of as the center of the discussion, as the subject, with everything else being the object, as the hegemonic form 
with everything else being the challenger. Or, or the um, uh, the opponent, or, a radi or, or the radicals that bring, trying to bring it down. As states weaken, they're not going to go away. And this is, I wrote an article on this guy 20 years ago now. Um, we're going to see more and more politics, security, strategy, economy, decided by, I think, much more traditional means than we believed would be the case, where honor and patronage what we call informality, which encompasses a whole bunch of things, becomes central to decisions about political structure, about decision making, about resource, production, distribution, and all the other things that we have imagined that the state dominated and, and sort of had a hegemonic hold over. Let me stop there. We can go into a lot of this. Um, in the Q&A, but we did start late, so I want to give my colleagues a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, overview, and uh, obviously later on we like to get your uh, views on uh, the Balkans, uh, exactly. <laughs> sure. Um, and your, your uh, experience there, but um, at, at any rate, uh, we'll come back to many of the issues that you raised, okay? <coughs> Thank you, Yona, and many thanks also to the Potomac Institute. It is an honor for me to be here today so that I may share some of my comments and worries on the matter of secessionism. If we were to apply the right of self-determination to every people with some differentiated language, the world would have 9,000 more countries, mm. enough to make it impossible to maintain an appropriate international political order and stability. The general security of the Western Hemisphere undoubtedly will be affected. Secession is not admitted in most countries. The German Constitutional Court rule against an independence referendum in Bavaria in December 2016. The Italian Constitutional Court adopted a similar decision in 2015 on an independence referendum in the Benetton region. Again, on the same grounds, the Supreme Court of Alaska stated that secession is clearly anti-constitutional and cannot be put a statewide vote. The UK and Canada are the exceptions since their laws foresee the possibility of a referendum. Not so in Spain, where the Constitution states that Spain is indivisible, Constitution that was approved by 93% of the Catalan voters in a nationwide referendum on 1978. Like in Germany, Italy, and Alaska, the Spanish Constitutional Court has unanimously and repeatedly declare that the regional government cannot start a procedure for a declaration of independence of Catalonia. According to the United Nations doctrine and to the international jurisprudence, the international law related to the self-determination of peoples only allows the right to independence to those peoples under colonial rule or subject to foreign subjugation, domination, exploitation, or communities whose ethnic, religious, linguistic, or cultural identity are repeatedly persecuted by national institutions and their peripheral agents or whose members are subject to systematic and severe discrimination in the exercise of their civil and political rights. Nothing in the 1966 International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights or in any other treaty on human rights nor in international jurisprudence points to the recognition of a right of subnational territorial communities to pronounce themselves on its independence and separation from the state. The general norms of international law do not prohibit sovereign states in accordance with the principles of, of self-organization from having their own legal framework, principles and procedures for the separation of their territorial communities. Far from doing so, the clear majority of the states proclaim their unity and territorial integrity as the basic principles of their constitutional order. The European Union respects and protects the national identity and constitutional and self-ruling structure of its member states. In addition, European Union law demands for them to respect and enforce the rule of law, 
so that all public authorities are subject to the constitution, the law and its implementation by the courts. Consequently, since Catalonia is not an entity entitled to the right of separation from the state, the right to the self-determination cannot constitute the legal basis to declare unilaterally an independent state breaking the peaceful coexistence in which Spain has thrived for the past 40 years. Succession runs contrary to the wishes of most Spaniards to live in a united country. As you know, the fall of dictatorship culminated with the constitution of 1978 and the establishment of a democratic regime. Catalonia was recognized as a nationality and the Catalan language became co-official with the Spanish. Catalonia and its culture have become more accepted and included in the Spain as a whole. Territorial diversity is essential to Spain and a source of pride and richness. The constitution recognizes that Spain is made up of different nationalities and it gives our 17 autonomous communities more self-government and power than ever before, similar to federal states in the United States. Defending the constitution is not an option. It is a commitment to democracy. <coughs> Why Catalonia, who came together to form Spain in 1492, has been suffering the political behavior of some secessionist plans carrying out an extremely disloyal and relentless campaign to discredit the nation before the international community, attempting to portray Spain as a despotic state that suppresses the national sentiment, refuses to negotiate with a peaceful movement and exploits Catalonia economically, allow me to share some pragmatic comments with you. Corruption, first. Catalonian political elite has been soiled from the past three years by a succession of corruption and conflict of interest scandals. One of the biggest is the money laundering in Andorra and other tax havens involving the Pujol family. Mm -hmm. Jordi Pujol, president of Catalonia during more than 30 years, is subject now to criminal responsibilities, and some close members of his family are in jail. Also, there is enough evidence that high authorities of Catalonia have collaborated on a bribery since in which 3% of the value of public contracts and awards were paid outside public channels. Prosecution and charges are detailing with these criminal actions. It is obvious that all the people prosecuted or investigated were looking anxiously for an independent state to get an umbrella of immunity through a new judici judiciary body arising from an independent state. Two, radical parties for the left with connections to Venezuela and other rogue states are backing the independent objectives. Also, there is evidence that some Islamists are in favor of the separatist cause through an organization controlled by the secessionists called New Catalans, mm -hmm. integrated by people from the Maghreb. In 2012, the Spanish Ministry of Interior had already alerted officials in the government of Catalonia of the presence of the presence of some dangerous Salafists in the territory. Out of 98 Salafist mosques in Spain, 50 are in Catalonia. I'm sure that you would like to know the current political climate in Catalonia. Maybe you know that no authority of the Catalan government, not even its president, has declared the independence of Catalonia. Moreover, in a twisted turn event, they found an around about way to allow a secret voting process, achieving a decision which could possibly end with criminal responsibilities, including rebellion and sedition, due to a clear violation of the Constitution and the jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court. Within one hour of the illegal voting by the Catalan Parliament, Spain's Prime Minister announced that he would dismantle Catalonia's government, suspend its ministers, dissolve its upstart legislature, take over the regional police, close any Catalan so-called embassies abroad with a $50 million budget per annum and announced that there will be regional elections on December 21st. The central government easily won permission for the, for the Senate to take control of Catalonia invoking Article 155 of the Constitution. Soraya Saez de Santa Maria, vice president of the central government, has been appointed president of the Catalonia government. In me immediately after these events, European Council President Donald Tusk tweeted, for European Union, nothing changes. Spain remains our only interlocutors. The State Department of the United States also came down on the side of Spain, 
Catalonia is an integral part of Spain and the United States supports the Spanish government's constitutional measures to keep Spain strong and united. Germany, Belgium, Italy, UK, France, Portugal, Finland, Argentina, Mexico, and most of the Spanish community countries and the Vatican supported the constitutional order of Spain, rejecting the legal declaration of independence. The United Nations, through its General Secretary, declared that any solution must be adopted inside the Constitution Order of Spain. The NATO said that the Constitution must be respected. Only few exceptions. Of course, Venezuela, Ecuador and Bolivia, following Bolivarian attitudes, remain silent. Main opposition political parties also spoke out against the secessionists and supported the governments. As I explained before, Prime Minister Rajoy, urged the Senate to approve Article 155 to prevent Catalonia from being abused. Catalans must be protected from an intolerant minority that is awarding itself ownership of Catalonia and is trying to subject all Catalans to the yoke of its own doctrine. There has been a corporate exodus as more and more Catalan business leave Catalonia in the face of poor legal security offered, offered by the secessionists. As of today, close to 2,000 companies have left. Prosecutors are presenting legal actions against the former president, the ca his counselors, and the president of the Parliament of Catalonia. The prosecutor is asking for a seven million and three hundred thousand dollars bail. The former president is now in Belgium and has retained the same legal office that defended years ago members of ETA terrorist group. The situation can this situation cannot continue. We will adopt all unnecessary measures to ensure that this turmoil cease. Although the damage is huge, I am still confident on the future. We have overcome many adversities, and we will surpass this one with the backing of the law and the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Uh, we'll come back to you on the case study of Catalonia, of course, and um, other related um, issues such as the lessons uh, from the challenge of uh, ETA. Thank All right. You Thank you. Yes, that was, uh, that was very well said, I think, uh, about Catalonia. But anyway, um, thank you very much for uh, including me today. I'm going to uh, look at the question um, precisely as it's worded and with an emphasis on the first word, can, not will, the state system and separatism coexist, but can they coexist? And I'm going to uh, look at it in the Middle Eastern context uh, specifically because I think that there are uh, some patterns in the Middle East that, that, um, uh, that are emerging that suggest a potential way that uh, separatism and the state system can coexist peacefully. I mean, you're, you're quite right uh, that th there's always been separatism and there always will be, but uh, the question is can they coexist in a modus vivendi or not? Um, now, th there are two uh, main long-standing independence movements uh, in the Middle East, right? One is the Kurds uh, and the other is the Palestinians. And I think th these are very interesting cases to read against each other uh, because I think you end up going in the same direction but coming from, you know, going into the same conclusion but from very, very different directions. So let's begin with the Kurds for a second. Uh, the uh, real independence push uh, in the KRG uh, in northern Iraq led by uh, Masoud Barzani who has uh, essentially resigned and frozen the presidency uh, of Iraq. It exists, but there is no president. It's quite a remarkable um, ma maneuver. Um, essentially uh, did, did the math wrong, right? I mean, there are four powers that uh, ha would help to determine the outcome, right? Uh, Tehran, Baghdad, Ankara, and Washington. All right. Now, it, it, it seems obvious that for Kurds, you've got to have at least two on your side to offset another two. And what they managed to do was arrange all four against them simultaneously so that the response was a disaster from a Kurdish point of view, 
uh, you know, an absolute disaster. Uh, now, what this does, what this, the disaster of Kirkuk and now the border crossings, by the way, which is really, I mean, this, this actually has a great deal of significance because if the Iraqi military's control over those areas is consolidated uh, and Iraq uh, emerges as a kind of Iranian vassal, then the land bridge <laughs> between uh, Iran and the Mediterranean and Lebanon becomes uh, doable, you know, in a way that wasn't, it was harder to imagine um, a few days ago even. Um, but I think what, what you're looking at here is a situation where uh, Kurds have been given a very strong and salutary reminder, a kind of a bucket of cold water in the face to, 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 to remind them of how difficult it's going to be to achieve full de facto independence that involves a membership in the United Nations General Assembly and all the other trappings of formal sovereignty. Um, and uh, how the, the extent to which that really is a very long-term uh, process uh, and is not readily achievable in the medium run. Uh, so what is achievable in the medium run, I would argue, and uh, it, it's a pity that the Kurds have lost so much leverage with this ca catastrophe that they've inflicted on themselves, um, uh, because what I think you can start to imagine in Iraq is not just a federal Iraq, right, but a confederated Iraq. This is, I think, I think this is the notion that begins to suggest itself in the Middle East, is that um, I, I, the state system, as represented by the Iraqi state, can retain its formal existence, can retain its amour propre, its basic uh, sense of unity, uh, because there is a confederation called Iraq. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Kurds and others, potentially, uh, in Iraq can enjoy what amounts to uh, de facto sovereignty, you know, going into much greater uh, detail than the uh, current system allows, um, and so that, in, in effect, the substance of independence is enjoyed uh, by the KRG and Erbil, but within the framework of, of a confederation. This is, uh, it would be very difficult to achieve this. However, I, I would argue that if the, s if the state system and the state of Iraq in this case were to uh, make that huge concession uh, to radical local autonomy bordering on de facto independence and a uh, separatist group like the Kurds would make this similarly large concession of not being formally fully independent but rather being part of a confederation uh, in which they can, you know, have uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the blender of sovereignty but not the box that the blender came in, if you, if you allow me to put it that way, um, that this could be a modus vivendi. Now, the Palestinians, <coughs> coming at it from exactly the opposite point of view, I think you end up in a very similar place. Because <coughs> what Palestinians have wanted historically first was to reverse 1948 and to assert uh, Arab <coughs> domination of all of Palestine and to restore the, the Palestinian state. Uh, and then having uh, accepted after 1973 uh, that this was not possible, uh, e embracing the idea of a two-state solution and therefore emerging as a separatist group in effect, right? Uh, and that's what Palestinians have been pursuing uh, since the late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, however, I, I think most serious observers looking at the situation would conclude that uh, the, the, the two-state solution as we have been discussing it since Madrid uh, is really not available anymore, right? I mean, they, they just look at the Israeli uh, de facto annexation bill for Mali Adumim and all these settlements. Uh, the, the, tenden, the trend is in precisely the opposite direction. Uh, and I think that while clearly any rational observer would have said, yes, a, a kind of two-state, two Westphalian states uh, model here, a kind of Balkan, po Yugoslav model, would, uh, would have been the ideal one. Uh, I think it, it has receded to the point that it's no longer, it's, it's very hard to imagine it happening. It's much easier, 
I think, to imagine the emergence of a, uh, but then at the same time, you won't have this single state, right, that, that, that um, uh, idealists dream of where, you know, sort of everyone has equal rights between the river and the sea. That's just not uh, something that Jewish Israelis are going to agree to either. I think what does emerge as a possibility is, again, a kind of confederation between uh, Israel and a kind of Palestine. And more than that, I think that if you <coughs> really extrapolate, if that's in, in, in a sense successful, you can imagine an Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian, very, very loose confederation, kind of Benelux kind of thing or something like that, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, as a way of mediating between uh, these different interests. And so you end up in, in a very similar place. And by the way, uh, even though this uh, idea is not, do doesn't correspond to anything that Israelis necessarily want, and certainly not pal what Palestinians want, I there is a great virtue in this idea in the sense that you could begin to address the issues of 1948 and refugees and things like that uh, in a way that a two-state solution as classically defined wouldn't let you do. So what I'm suggesting is that there's there this the notion of very loose confederation suggests itself as a potential way forward uh, with regard to the Kurds and with regard to the Palestinians. More than that, it ad I think that this model potentially addresses issues that are very damaging but are not actually secessionist movements. In other words, uh, that uh, this could be a broader model in Syria. Uh, where uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not exactly that there are secessionist movements instead, except maybe the Kurds in Rojava in the north, but the rest of the country is not being beset by separatist movements. There's no drive for an Alawite state or for uh, Sunni states or anything like that. It's a battle for power in Syria, yet a very decentralized Syrian state could, uh, could function uh, you know, it could replace the war, and it's hard to imagine anything else replacing the war in, you know, sort of throughout the country and being stable. Uh, and the same applies in Iraq, where you can imagine that uh, in the Sunni areas, uh, Sunni Arab Sunni areas, um, a, uh, a set of structures similar to the KRG begin to emerge. And again, uh, but there's a lot of interest in this, uh, I think, in a very quiet way in the Gulf where the UAE, for example, which is a, uh, a kind of a confederation, cross between a federation and a confederation, uh, is sort of gently proposing to Iraqis and others that they could give consider this model. And uh, of course, it would look very different. It would look very different from uh, the UAE. It would, uh, I think the way you can do it in Iraq and the way you can do it in Syria will look, will look rather different. Um, and you can do it formally. Uh, through a kind of constitutional structure, or frankly, you could do it informally because if this something like this uh, has emerged in Lebanon organic, fairly organically, uh, and is there is a, um, a, a, a kind of an under, a set of understandings that have replaced a war uh, and a, an equilibrium of unstable elements, right? <laughs> something like that, but it does work. Um, Two more points uh, that I would like to make. One is the, the, the great threat to the state system in the Middle East does not come from the separatists, right? And it does, because what the separatists want, uh, the Kurds, the Palestinians, is to add more states to the state system. They're not challenging the system. They're challenging states, the Israeli state, uh, the uh, Iraqi state, uh, as based in Baghdad. The, the challenge, though, there, I mean, the, globally speaking, the biggest challenge to any state system is in the Middle East, and it comes from especially the Salafist jihadist groups, Daesh, which you know, tore down the borders between Iraq and Syria, which rejects utterly the concept of statehood, which, which yearns for a, a caliphate, which they tried to create. Um, I think the same applies to Al-Qaeda, although it's more aspirational for them. Uh, and it's not an immediate goal, but a longer-term goal. And it even applies to the Muslim Brotherhood, which, which again looks to some kind of caliphate in the even more distant and aspirational future. So that it, I, I, I would argue that uh, that is the great threat to the states, states and the state system in the Middle East. And um, the, the same 
dynamic in a way applies, or an equal aspect, is applies to uh, non-state actors and militias, particularly those aligned with Iran, uh, whether it's the Iraqi militias uh, or various others, or Hezbollah, which is a remarkable institution in the sense that it kind of left, leapt over the uh, state um, status, and it has gone from being a, essentially a Lebanese militia and political party to being a transnational uh, phenomenon, right? I mean, it, it, it is definitely not a Lebanese, uh, strictly speaking, phenomenon anymore. It is in Syria, it is in Yemen, uh, it is in uh, wherever. Uh, the pro-Iranian alliance needs a revolutionary vanguard strike force. Hezbollah will be there. In fact, had the fighting in Tuz Kharmato and other places in Iraq gone badly, I think it was very easy to imagine Hezbollah now no longer as badly needed post Aleppo in Syria, actually going over the border to help the Hash and uh, you know the other groups had they gotten into trouble, which th they did not. Um, so uh, essentially what I'm suggesting is that there are these uh, groups, whether it's the Salafist jihadists <laughs> or the uh, non-state actors, that really cannot live with the state system in, in a modus vivendi. But the separatist groups, like the Kurds and the Palestinians, particularly in the context of very loosely defined uh, confederated or federal structures tailored to the individual situations, uh, I think can uh, um, live together. The one final thought is that this, that this idea is by no means a panacea. It's by no means a one-size-fits-all. There are plenty of uh, problems that it would not resolve. For example, Bahrain. Uh, you know, a confederation is not the solution in Bahrain. Some kind of a, a re- formatted constitutional monarchy is probably the only a deal, a political deal. Uh, but Bahrain is too small, both geographically and demographically, to uh, have this make any sense, and it's not going to happen. So uh, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there are a whole series of cases where loose confederations could be. And so that again, I'm addressing the question, can they live together, not will they? Because I'm not really very confident that this is what's going to happen. Uh, but I am confident that it could work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> very uh, interesting uh, uh, insights. So we'll come ba back to it. Uh, from that region, we're moving to Asia. And uh, we would like to invite Marvin to uh, address some of the issues related to uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, etc. Thank you, Yana. Uh, nice to be back here. Uh, yeah, I so I want to uh, foc focus on, on just the, those two countries because I think in a way <clears throat> they're an excellent combination for the, our analytical purposes. Um, they represent two interesting, uh, in some ways contrasting cases of coexistence of the state and separatist movements between the centripetic or centripetic forces of modern institutions mm -hmm. and the centrifugal forces uh, which really are ones of identity uh, and especially ethnic identity. Well, Pakistan is a classic example of, <coughs> of this tension. It's a relatively strong state, but a weak nation. Afghanistan is a weak state, but yes, actually a strong nation. And in its own way, may be anomalous here, completely. You know, it, I, I'm, I'm always taken aback when not only our president, but the previous president as well, um, and uh, everyone refers to the term uh, nation building. No, no. Uh, what they're talking about is state building. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't do much about nations. Nations, as I say, 
our, our identity. Identity develops over time. It is an evolutionary process. You don't, you don't, you, there's no way in which you can uh, do very much to, to further that process. Uh, you can muddy the waters, but to create identity, obviously, is one thing. We, we're better at the business of institution building. We've had some, the international community has had some successes here, uh, but that's, that's particularly difficult, especially when you're talking about states that are starting from a very low uh, place uh, when it comes to the availability of uh, effective institutions. Well, as, as you all know, Pakistan uh, really is a fusion of a great many nationalities, uh, having only in common a, what appeared to be a common Islamic belief, uh, led by a uh, founding father who himself could not, was not sure what kind of country uh, he expected to have or even wanted to have, uh, as between secular and, and, and religious. And it's a country which continues to suffer from the trauma of the loss of the eastern part of the country, which became Bangladesh. Uh, uh, this was, uh, this was a indeed bloody separation. And as we were discussing beforehand, Bangladesh is interesting because we couldn't come up between 1945 in 1971, were any, there was any example here of a state that was, uh, that was divided uh, because of the success of the secessionist movement. Um, and of course, that speaks to, and continues to, the way in which the state system as it exists, the cards are, are really stacked against separatism because obviously uh, to set a precedent here uh, is, uh, is certainly the, something that they all will resist. And I might mention here today, I think that that's particularly uh, obvious here with what's happened with South Sudan. Mm. That has been such a bad example of, of the idea of trying to build a state and nation state here. Um, that uh, one has to take, uh, certainly, take a certain amount of uh, fine uh, reason for caution. Uh, by the way, that separation, which, is, which stands out now uh, so much, it was ethnicity, culture, which was the underlying basis of it but of course, if you study it, you'll see it was political. That system did not have to break up. Uh, it was a power play by the western part of the country to, uh, to prevent the east, which was at that time more populous, from having political uh, control mm -hmm. over the country. Uh, so although it, uh, it was always something which uh, was, the countries were divided by the way if you know your geography, divided by about 1,500 miles. Uh, so it was really a jerry-built system to begin with. Uh, now, aside, Pakistan today uh, is made up of uh, a predominant, it's about 65% of the population call themselves Punjabis, and uh, three remaining provinces are identified with ethnic groups, the Sindhis, the Baluch, and the Pashtuns. Uh, and the point here is that they have coexisted with the state. They have successfully <laughs> held together uh, partly because of that trauma of Bangladesh. Now, having said that, there is a rebellion going on and has been since about 1975 off and on uh, in Baluchistan. Uh, 
The other two, the Sindhis and the Pashtuns, have asserted their identity, but what we have seen here and so often is it's not about separatism, it's about getting a better deal. Separatism is used here as a, as a shorthand for saying that we're just not getting, we're not getting our fair share of the pie. <clears throat> and the Baluch, the Baluch case is very interesting because it's a separatist movement within a uh, separatist movement. Uh, the Baluch actually today make up a minority of Baluchistan, which is the smallest uh, uh, in terms of population, but the largest in terms of size and, um, uh, and has much of the natural resources of the country, which is why there's so much at issue here about being getting a fairer a deal from the center. And a natural resist, or re I should say, a natural uh, resentment here against the Punjabi portion of the population, which is not only largest, but is the wealthiest part of the country uh, as a province, uh, and not unimportantly, is the part of the country which can ac accounts for uh, the nearly uh, 80% of the military. And that's, of course, critical in terms of the uh, division of the spoils. Uh, now, the potential in Pakistan, despite these centrifugal forces, which I'm saying have really, since Bangladesh, remained under control, there is there is a great deal of fear, and you still hear this, about people referring to the country breaking up. Uh, I would submit to you that there is no country that would welcome Pakistan's breaking up, mm -hmm. uh, not only in principle here, but because of the consequences of that in terms particularly of what uh, we face today with respect to extreme militant extremist groups because they would be the major beneficiaries. And it's often said in, in Pakistan that what India wants to do is to see a breakup of the country. Actually, uh, uh, that's not the fa fact. Uh, India certainly wants to reduce the threat that Pakistan poses, uh, especially now as a nuclear power. But if you worry about conflict, uh, the dangers of conflict rise exponentially, I think, if any kind of serious uh, breakup here, because uh, what it is, is it's the military which controls the nuclear weapons, controls foreign policy, controls security policy. And as long as the military remains strong, and it is, it's cohesive, it's professional, uh, it has good reason to be because it monopolizes much of the wealth of the country. But as long as it is, it has every incentive here to want to be able to keep this country intact. Uh, the military fought desperately against back Bangladesh's uh, succession uh, and would have succeeded. Kill it managed to kill off much of the intellectual cadre of the country, uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed, fellow Pakistanis, just to keep it, and it would have remained within Pakistan except for India's intervention. Mm. Now, what about Afghanistan? Uh, it's really interesting here because Afghanistan has, you would think, all the ingredients of a country that should be a breeding ground for separatism. And in fact, when most people here uh, who don't follow Afghanistan closely, they think about it in terms of all the tribes, the ethnic groups, and so on, and they imagine here uh, a country whose cement is, is, is breaking apart. But it's strange, as I said before, it's actually a nation. It's a nation of different identities, but 
a nation that nevertheless clings to the idea that we're Afghans. Uh, how do we explain that? Well, it may very well be that it has to do with being a landlocked country, but uh, the fact that the options here, uh, the idea of there being a separate Tajik nation, uh, you know, really would be far-fetched. Uh, but there is a Tajikistan, there is an Uzbekistan, there is a Turkmenistan, which border on Afghanistan, so why not think in terms of amalgamation with, with these uh, uh, countries? Uh, well, they were never, it was never an attractive uh, uh, proposition, <coughs> partly because, as it turns out, those three countries culturally, although referring to themselves in those three ethnic categories, uh, had changed so culturally during the Soviet period of rule of Soviet Union that they no longer resembled very much the, those same groups inside Afghanistan. Well, they, as I say, they, they would seem to be candidates here uh, given this, and, they d and there is competition here. I don't want to suggest that there isn't. But once again, it's over power, and power, of course, is, is directly related to uh, the <coughs> capture of, uh, 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 of resources. Now, the one exception here is, and, and the interesting case here, is something called Pashtunistan. And that is the idea which emerged in the 1960s uh, and continues to be uh, what many people to think that the underlying conflict between it, Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, the idea that there should be a separate Pashtun state. What happened was that in 1893, the British came in and decided in the, using the strategy obviously of divide and rule, that they were gonna split the Pashtun population in half. Uh, half of it would be on the Afghan side of the, of the, of the Afghanistan had just at that point consolidated as a, as a modern state. Before that, it really was not. Uh, and British India. Uh, why control the Pashtuns? Because they were unruly. Uh, then as well as now, uh, at least the tribals. And so what, is ha what happened was that this was revived, uh, this concept here of having a Pashtunistan, but interestingly, it was never one in which the Afghans were saying that there ought to be a separate Pashtun state, but, and if there were, we would cede our Pashtuns to that state. It was always about, and continues to be always about, carving a piece of Pakistan out as a Pashtun state. Uh, uh, of course, that has been uh, deeply resented by the Pakistanis, and it's, it's a, the major irritant, uh, historical certainly, and still is alive because no Afghan was prepared to give up on that card. Even the Taliban, when they, were, when they took over, they showed no inclination, in fact, they pretty much refused, to, to drop the idea of a Pashtunistan. And of course, the Taliban were largely, and still are, largely Pashtun. So uh, here is a, a, a concept which will never come into being, but one which figures very strongly here in the relationship between the two countries. Uh, Pakistan very much insistent upon that border being inviolate. Uh, and uh, the Afghans seeing this as something which is unsettled, something which was colonially uh, 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 imposed and therefore uh, today uh, unjustifiable and, and uh, 
illegitimate. Well, let me let me conclude here by by saying that uh, again the with Af regard to Afghanistan, that is there a danger here that despite what I just said here, that Afghanistan could break up. Uh, and there is. And it would not break up if it did along s the kinds of ethnic identity lines here that we would have normally anticipated here. It would break up as the consequence here of a conflict, a chaotic conflict, because what people, I think, fail to recognize, and this is included here in our own, polic our own policy makers, is that if the Kabul government falls, it's not going to be replaced as it was in the 1990s by a Taliban regime. And of course, the Taliban had virtually consolidated control of the entire country in the, in the eve of 9-11, and would still be there today, perhaps, if there had never been a 9-11. And by the way, we had no interest when we did go in there in, 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 uh, in regime change. Well, what we're looking at today is that if the Kabul government fails, it's not that the Taliban will succeed. The situation today is very different than what it was in the 90s, including the fact that there is now a Pakistani Taliban which means that even the, the Pakistanis don't want to see, as they did in the 90s, a victory on the part of the Taliban, certainly, to monopolize power. But what will occur if, if we see state failure now in Afghanistan is a chaotic civil war, and a civil war in which will, where there will be proxy capture uh, different elements here will gravitate toward Iran, Pakistan, the Russians. India will be deeply involved. And this is the kind of uh, picture that I think we should keep in mind here when those who say, well, let's, let's, we can arrange a power sharing arrangement here. First of all, uh, Unlike the 90s, there is no single interlocutor here, uh, which would be uh, Mullah, then Mullah Omar's the Taliban. That doesn't exist anymore. If there is a civil war, it will be insurgents against insurgents. It will be, it will be in all probability, elements around various warlords, commanders, fighting one another for turf, all very much dependent upon the support of outside powers. So I think we ought to keep this in mind here, that uh, th this is the reality here of Afghanistan, not uh, a breakup. Let me just conclude with this. Years ago, I was sent by, I was then working in the State Department, uh, and I was sent to talk to, um, the Mujahideen. No, actually, I was not yet in the par department. I, uh, this came a little earlier. I was sent by USIA, then USIS, to go and talk of the idea of federalism, to talk to the then Mujahideen that when and if they came to power, that they would consider here a federal system. And you still hear people coming up with that as a solution for Afghanistan having a, a federal, which implies here that you have these neat ethnic categories which would then somehow uh, covet this kind of an outcome. I was shouted down by them. The idea of federalism, and it comes back to my point here, the Afghans said to me, the Mujahideen said, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to divide us? Are you trying to pit us against one another? And so 
a literal dirty word in Afghanistan continues to be the concept of federalism. Uh, whereas it fits our way of thinking so logically because we tend to see, to see things in terms of these larger ethnic or identity blocks. So, John, uh, Johan, uh, let, let me, let me, let me finish. Okay, we'll come back to it. Uh, obviously, we covered uh, very extensively uh, some of the re regions uh, in uh, Europe, the Middle East, um, and uh, <coughs> obviously um, in uh, Asia. Um, I regret again that our, our colleague from the Cameroon uh, is not uh, here today, but one, one of the concerns, uh, obviously, that they have in the Cameroon is the uh, uh, conflict of culture uh, between the English speaking and the French speaking, and uh, also <coughs> the problems uh, that they have to face um, from the Boko Haram from Nigeria, and Nigeria has its own <coughs> problems, as we know. Uh, it was mentioned the uh, South uh, Sudan, the Central uh, African Republic, the conflict between the um, Muslim um, group and the Christians and so on. So at any rate, we know about the problems uh, and the conflict. We want to go back to, to the panel and ask um, again to elaborate maybe some of the issues that they raise. <coughs> and my, my question is, uh, what's the bottom line in terms of some of the solutions or options uh, available? Dr. Ibosha spoke um, about uh, some of the cases related to the Middle East whether it is the one state solution or two state solution, confederation, uh, and so forth. And uh, my, my question is again, whether we can uh, consider some other possibilities such as the option of autonomy of self uh, governing power, if you will, as uh, one of the options in order to maintain the state uh, structures. At any rate, why don't we go around um, and ask the panelists uh, to make any observation they wish uh, on the other presentations or to elaborate on some of their um, comments. Which order you want? Yes. Me, all yes, right. Um, th there's a lot to this. Um, I recently saw Henry Kissinger on a, on a, a panel uh, on, on C-SPAN, and he made the point that when he, when he spoke to the Chinese, he asked questions very much in, in, your, in, in your vein about solutions and problems. And the Chinese said, you Americans, you think in terms you can fix things, that, the, that, they're, that you're looking for solutions to things. We Chinese recognize that every apparent solution simply leads to more problems. And, I wanna, and, and that's where I am with, with all of this. We are not going to solve this, any of these issues, uh, in, the con in, in some kinds of autonomy or confederation or federation, anything neat that is going to end these conflicts and, and, and somehow create in some sort of teleological, um, um, fant my, my, my view, fantastic world where we don't have very serious conflicts going on. That just isn't going to happen. Um, you asked me to talk about Yugoslavia before, and I think I, I will mention it now, just um, be because I think different pieces of what used to be called Yugoslavia have some ana uh, analog they're somewhat anal analogous with some of the other issues that, that have come up. Uh, come up. Keep in mind that both the Middle East and the Balkans, although they have many, many differences between them, many differences, but one thing they have in common is they are both peripheries of the former Ottoman Empire that have not been stable since that empire receded. They have not found stability. To focus on the European part of it, mostly not so much the Middle East, in the Balkans, the West it has existed underneath a series of security caps imposed from the outside from the greater powers in Europe each of which has lasted about a generation and then collapsed. Once the external security cap fractures, the area, uh, the situation in the Balkans would fall apart, whether it's 1914, 1941, again in 1945, and then after 1989. Yugoslavia itself 
had been an amalgamation of parts of, of, parts of the Sl South Slavic world that had been in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. They had different experiences, pushed together after World War I, first as a Serbian kingdom, then during World War II, Hitler divides things up, and those four years are worth looking at. The, the Nazi version of, 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 of uh, what's now with the Balkans still has resonance, especially when you consider the fact that when the Croats, that Croatia consi still considers the fascist Ustasha regime as legitimate in terms of being an expression of the Croatian nation, they still have the Kuna, or they did, really, they had to have the Kuna, I mean, they still do. They want to be in the Euro, but still the Kuna, which was the fascist currency. So all of, the, all of these different security caps resonate in, in the area. The Titoist regime, not a Serb national state, and a defeat for the Serbs, in the Serbian view, lasts as long as Tito does. Then 10 years more, people expected it to fall apart. Then when people thought it might hold together, then it fell apart. You never know. What has come since is a shattering that itself is not stable. There will be further fighting in my view. I don't know when, I'm not sure which place, but, but Bosnia, Macedonia, Kosovo will not stand as they are, in my view, for different reasons. Over the last week, as Catalonia has kind of careened into this, this, this exercise that was, so able, that was so well described by, uh, by, by Professor F uh, Jimenez, um, and as they've realized that things are going badly for them, they've tried to use Slovenia as a model. If the, a couple of the Catalan leaders might say, well, we want to be like Slovenia. At first, Slovenia declared independence, looked for separation. Everybody said, no, 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 because they all tried to preserve Yugoslavia. But a year later, it was independent. Mm. So some of the Catalans are talking that way. It's bad history, as was the response from Jan Claude Juncker, who said, no, no, Slovenia left because it was leaving a repressive regime. The fact is, Slovenia, like Catalonia, relatively wealthy, had been chafing at the siphoning of its resources for other parts of the country mm. and had wanted to get away. Slovenia began undermining Yugoslavia before Slobodan Milosevic, the guy who's usually thought of as the great villain and the guy who broke up, all, that caused the wars of the 90s, before he ever came to power, the Slovenes were already undermining the Federation. They almost broke it up in 1984. The entire cabinet had to fly to Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia, to stop that. So Catalonia, I think, should choose a different analog. Also, Slovenia had a unit, everybody, it was very clear that there was no split in Slovenia. They all wanted to get away, because after all, we are not in the Balkans, we are Central European. And we are not like those Serbs. I heard this repeatedly when I used to go there for official exchanges. To me, Vojvodina may be a little more like Catalonia. Vojvodina is a part of Serbia, north of the Danube, that was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, not the Ottoman Empire, as was the rest of Serbia. That's the Serbia part of the Ottoman Empire. Again, relatively wealthy. They're not trying to break away, but they've come, they've come to terms as long as they can protect their resources. The Kadlabs might want to think about that before they just try to, to, to break away. Vojvodina is actually doing pretty well, I would, I, I, I would argue. A question was raised about Afghanistan and about why, you know, why it doesn't split apart. You've got Turkmenistan, you've got, you know, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. It may be that local notables in those areas, and I don't know this, I'm not an expert on it, it may be that local notables in those areas don't really want to break away from an Afghanistan that is a weak state, that enables them to operate their patronage networks much better than they might if they attach themselves to a mother country that might have bigger notables from the same group who might come and step on those people. This is something like what's going on with Republika Srpska, the part of Bosnia that is Serbia. Bosnia is a divided country. It, 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 it was partitioned. We don't call it that, but it was. It's, a con it's confederal, but it, uh, supposedly, but that, uh, I'm not as sanguine on confederation, um, frankly, as a, as, as a colleague here. I, I, Professor Ibish, I, 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 they, they want a confederation to an extent in, in Bosnia, and it is not working at all. Part of it, the Serb part of it, is run as a central, basically a centralized little entity. The other part, which actually existed before Bosnia, this makes your head hurt, I know, this is the Balkans. The other part, the Croatian Muslim Bosniak Federation, was actually created before Bosnia was, be, became a country, before the Dayton Agreement, it was a year, a year and a half earlier. That part is cantonal, it's confederal, all right, but the two sides hate each other so much, 
they w they barely talk to each other, and that and and so the it, number three is always a bad number in these things. It's always two against one, and, the, and it's the Serbs and the Croats who are kind of ganging up on the Bosniaks. The head of the Republic of Serbska, Milo, Mirad Dodik, who was the great Democrat, sold himself to us that way, then snookered us, and now we can't. Now we try, we even try to get rid of him for a while. We can't seem to do that. He always speaks of secession, separation. But he knows full well that the Bosnian Serbs, who have been in charge there since 91, and the Serbs in Serbia don't get along very well. The local Bosni Bosnian Serb notables don't want to be dominated by the folks in Belgrade. Mm. So he always speaks of separation, but the various referenda he's actually put down on paper never say the words. So I, again, I don't want to get, th there's so much more uh, to this that I don't want to bore you anymore. I'll just make the general point that we are not going to get to the point where autonomy or confederation or two-state solutions are going to solve these things. In my view, the Palestinian case is unique because it really isn't about any kind of separation. It's still two people in one state. Never was a two-state solution. Even a two-state agreement would not be a two-state solution because of the Michael Collins problem. Michael Collins, remember the IRA military chief, makes a deal with the British on splitting up Ireland. That causes a civil war. He gets killed. Any Palestinian, in my view, who tries to make a deal with the Israelis along any line that would be acceptable to the Israelis, that is, an arrangement where a so-called Palestinian state will not have real control over its own security because Israeli security will always come first as far as the Israelis are concerned for very good reasons. Palestine could not be allowed to be a really functioning state. It would not have the security apparatus. Couldn't. Therefore, any agreement signed by the Palestinians, in my view, will be submarined by spoilers as Michael Collins found out. Unfortunately, that situation, somewhat like between Serbs and Albanians perhaps, is an existential to the death struggle that will be decided by the wars of the future as so many other conflicts like this have been, been dealt with over time. We imagine sometimes that because we now have run the world, because it's our solution, and we, am, we have words like international community, transparency, rule of law, various slogans. We imagine that this time it's going to be different because we're in charge of it, because, because these things don't happen in the 20th century. In my opinion, they still do, and they will, and we're going to have lots of meetings like this as they careen in various directions. Okay, great. We'll, we'll go around, uh, <coughs> and uh, obviously since we're coming to a late, uh, other questions that I think we have to <coughs> explore. Um, coming to Fernando, in terms of the Catalan uh, case, um, can you can you really comment number one in terms of the experience that you had uh, with Catalonia for a long time, whether you call it uh, autonomy or self-rule and uh, some stability, to the other case of the uh, ETA of you separatism of the Basque uh, country. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, in uh, Spain we have two or three uh, groups that could be uh, could be considered are, are historical uh, with historical background. Uh, the Basque country. Uh, Catalonia, because of the singularity, and Galicia, too. Mm. Uh, these have own language, uh, although the Galician is very uh, similar to the Castilian, but they have their own language. But uh, the history shows you, or show us, that uh, Spain was a unified country from 1492. I have at home uh, a document that I keep uh, with very, with <laughs> very uh, is a, is a excellent document that we call the letter of Barcelona. The letter of Barcelona is the let well the briefing the briefing actually I have in ancient ancient Castilian and in English. Uh, the letter of Barcelona is the the briefing that Christophorus Colombo submit to the King Ferdinand and Isabella 
when he arrived from the, the, <laughs> the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting document. But now what I want to emphasize is that in 1492, Cristoforo Colombo, under the service of the Spanish crown, came back and gave in Barcelona, not in Valladolid, not in Toledo, not in Seville, in Barcelona. That is, Barcelona was at that time, uh, maybe temporary, because the, the kings, they used to, to travel. The, the kings were there, and the palace still remained where the, the that is, that is, uh, when the secessionists, they try to manipulate the history, and they say that the, the history of the Catalonia starts 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's, it's just pure, it's what we, you call fake news. <laughs> Continue, we have as attended for five years, every day, every month, fake, fake, fake news. But the, the serious matter is not that the, the fake news goes through television or broadcasting, no, no. The fake news are teach in the schools. I have seen a text of one of my, uh, the son of one of my nephews, that in the text in the about the history, they teach the children that the civil war in Spain was a war uh, between Catalans and Spaniards. You know? <laughs> this is, uh, is that is, and why happened? Uh, I'm going to give you a reason. Uh, the, you asked me about an objective reason what we can we can we can arrive arrive at this sad point when the constitution was approved under the constitution uh, there were some provisions that allow transfers from infrastructures to from the central government to catalonia or to the basque country or to education agriculture that is a lot of uh, functions that uh, from the central government to the state, to the states, like uh, to the to the communities. One of the most sensitive one was the education. I I ask personally to the president of the government at that time, Adolfo Suarez. I ask him. We because I, I get advice also. We must be very careful of, uh, about education because. If they are going to teach or to train the children uh, in in a way that goes against the history, against the, the our our goals as a nation, uh, our values, we, we are in trouble. And I remember very well that he told me, <coughs> "Don't worry, Fernando. We always will keep what we call the hike inspection." That is the, the oversight, because the Constitution allows the central government to have an, what you call the high inspection body. Never, never the high inspection has carried out its task, its task. Never. But why? Not because they lack resources or finance, because they, they politically, politically, politically speaking, they, are, they were tied to the agreements, the political agreements between the central government and the, the nationalist parties. Because both of them, they need the votes to continue to continue in the government. One in the regional areas and the other one in the central. Socialists, conservatives, everybody ignore the big question. And we have arrived to this point. That one generation, they don't know anything about the country, about the, the, the culture, about, and, and we need to renew that. We cannot accept that because fortunately now we realize because of all these recent events, we realize that a big silent majority is asking the government, the central government, and the, to go ahead and to restructure everything. And this is what we, we have take the, the, and then, there is something uh, connected to all this. Countries, they must rule uh, under the rule of law. We cannot, that is, 
We cannot leave anybody to be above the law. Nobody is above the law. Everything can, can, we can carry out everything but under the law, not outside the law. Because otherwise, uh, and we are not in, in savage countries or re banana republics. No, no, we are in Europe and we are a democratic country. We have fought, uh, well, we, we obtained a grant that is a smooth transition from a dictatorship to a democracy. And we must preserve that. We ha my generation has fought uh, politically uh, in order to get a smooth transition, as you know. And uh, we have fought against ETA, but we have fought with the rule of law. Within the with, the, with the judiciary, with international cooperation, yeah. and we applying the law. And we have win, and we have win the ETA. And we are going to win this challenge. This challenge, I can tell you, is much easier. Too so much easier. Your question, mm. I have to make it clear. Uh, we'll sure. come back to it. And uh, Dr. Earl, if you yeah. can. I, I, yeah, I, I very briefly, I just want to say, I, I, thi I think I may have been misunderstood slightly uh, in the sense that when I speak about uh, loose confederations as a model, I'm not suggesting that they're likely. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that they are permanent solutions <laughs> by any means. Certainly that they are uh, not very messy. That's why I said, it, you, know, may it, uh, you know, one example of what this might look like is Lebanon, which is very messy, unstable, uh, as I said, an, a kind of an equilibrium of unstable elements, I called it. And, and you know, it could break down at any given moment. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, there are, I think, uh, three basic scenarios uh, in many of these contexts, like Iraq and uh, Syria and Libya and Yemen, uh, where we, you know, you you could posit the return of a uh, a highly unified centralized state run from the capital, right? Unitary state. But how plausible is that? I would, I would suggest to you that that's not something that's recuperable practically in Syria, in Iraq, et cetera. It's just not going to happen in my view. Uh, this, the the uh, unified centralized uh, state, unitary state is kind of broken. Um, or you can have on the other extreme, um, uh, as you say, endless conflict. And that is the most likely scenario in any given case where there are core interests at stake. It just people keep on fighting and in fits and starts. And then finally, there's a resolution based on uh, either uh, the conflict becomes obsolete or, or one party prevails and the other is simply crushed uh, permanently. Uh, and that, yes, that is uh, most likely, say, between Israel and the Palestinians, is that they will just keep on fighting. Uh, at a low level uh, until, it, uh, yeah, until it becomes obsolete or one party uh, simply gives up or, or what have you. Um, and uh, so what I'm not suggesting, uh, what I'm suggesting is that this generalized model of loose confederations is an alternative to both. It's an alternative to a quixotic effort to return to unified centrally ruled states that, uh, that are really not recuperable, that Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and an alternative potentially to endless conflict without end. I mean, uh, I, what I'm certainly not suggesting is that uh, this is a, uh, a clean or consistent or a long-term solution that will just uh, kind of work. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that it is what, it, 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 the, this general approach very loosely um, gives a kind of a roadmap to an alternative to conflict if anybody ever wants to avail themselves of it. And uh, you know, I, I'm as skeptical as the next person that that's what's going to happen. But the question you were asked is, can these two forces coexist? And in the Middle East, under the current circumstances, if, if separatism and states make those compromises that I described, then I think the answer in a very messy, short-term, and unstable way is yes. Oh. Obviously, it's, uh, it's a complicated issue, as uh, we know. But uh, the question before you even um, suggest um, some of the uh, mm -hmm. options of um, 
um, living side by side in peace, isn't the question related to a uh, consensus, let's say, yeah. of the Palestinians, um, what roadmap they would like to take? Is yes. it the Gaza Hamas model, or is it uh, the Abbas? a Palestinian authority model. I mean, definitely there's a, a, a core problem here, and but it's on both sides, actually. It's more dramatically um, visible uh, among Palestinians because of the split between uh, Hamas and Fatah. And the fact, you're quite right, you can't really easily fit the square peg of Hamas's armed struggle until victory model or rhetoric, rhetoric is the way to put it, I think. Um, into the round hole of the of the PLO and PA and Fatah's uh, a model of negotiating a two-state solution. Um, however, it's not as muddied as one might think because the PLO is the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians, and even Hamas admits this. Uh, of course, what they they complain about its structure; they want to take it over. <laughs> they they want to be the PLO. That's that's pretty clear. Um, but uh, it's, you know, there, there are uh, Palestinians who are legally and diplomatically authorized to make a deal. And I would argue that uh, a deal that provided really substantial benefits actually would have a good chance of being accepted. Uh, there, of course, there can be assassinations. Rabin was assassinated, Sadat was assassinated. These things can happen. Uh, but uh, I think you, p you, you know, people who are really suffering can also take s a substantial benefit that falls short of what they really want, but yet is is a uh, uh, is an improvement. And they would do it whining and crying and 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 complaining, but they would you know it c confronted with something rather than nothing. They there's a good chance they would take something. Uh, on the Israeli side. I think you have an almost equally severe crisis, although it, it is mediated within the well-functioning Israeli political system, uh, which is that there is no consensus at all in Israel uh, about uh, what to do with the occupied territories, about what the nature of the Jewish state is, about what, uh, you know, there's no, there's no consensus about what Israel is anymore. Uh, in, in, in Israel, and, and I think it's a really very big problem. If you, if you were to ask the Palestinian leadership, the PLO, what's your vision of the future? They could tell you quite easily. They could describe it. Says, I think if you went to Netanyahu uh, and, and asked him to describe his vision of the future, I don't think he can do it. I really don't think he can do it, and that's a problem. Well, uh, anyway, we don't want to complicate it a little bit more, but <laughs> There is no doubt that um, we find uh, the Arab, uh, some of the Arab states, uh, obviously Egypt and Jordan, yeah. who are trying to uh, promote advance the cause of peace. Yes. Uh, and of course uh, the Gulf states. The Gulf states too, yeah. That we know, um, and the relations that we know we don't know yeah. are going on. Um, so it is very dynamic. Yes, it is. And, and uh, that's uh, a source of hope. I'm the sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that the interest of the Gulf states of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in pursuing a new strategic relationship with Israel is a, a very promising angle that should be pursued. It would be terrible political malpractice to ignore it or, or let it lapse. You know. Uh, Marvin, I want to move to you very, very quickly because we. No, I, I would the audience an opportunity. Yeah, can you use the mic because. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm willing to cede my time <laughs> so that we can, we can have some questions. You are a true academic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone in the audience? Uh, yes. Uh, just one second. Take the mic. I'm Glenn Schweitzer from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, there is one story that hasn't been told, maybe a special story, but it's the emergence of Slovakia, mm -hmm. which was an easy move. And then uh, uh, there are all sorts of reasons why that happened, but it was then I then I was very much involved in the Kosovo business, and I just thought we were taking Kosovo too fast. 
Ambassador Zimmerman wanted to make a name for himself, mm -hmm. and it seems to me if we had been a little slower about the, about the Kosovo, we might have had an easier way out than the way, it w it, and we wouldn't have bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, et cetera. So I just offer those two, two comments. Slovakia was easy in 1993 in the way it could not have been in 1933. Right. Because World War II solved most of the border issues in Europe. It, it, by destroying Europe, basically, by destroying European power, these things didn't matter for as much anymore. I, Slovakia also, during the communist era, remember that both Dubček and Husak, both ends of the ideological spectrum, were both Slovaks. Hmm. So they'd had their time actually to run the communist Yugoslavia. Václav Havel was a great symbol of resistance. He was not a great politician. So that was also, so on the Czech side, you had a certain, before Václav Klaus became dominant, it was again easy to, to sort of man maneuver among the Czechs to make, to make uh, the, the separation uh, for, uh, benign. So that some of the reasons for Sl Slovakia. In Kosovo, I, it's, again, you speak in terms of how we'd fix it, how we might have done. I, I knew Warren Zerman pretty well. Um, I disagreed with him on a number of things. <coughs> um, Warren recognized that um, this was not going to go well uh, if um, uh, the German proposal, uh, Hans, remember that all this was happening during the period of Maastricht. As Yugoslavia is falling apart, Europe thinks it's coming together. It was embarrassing for the EU. They told us, we're going to handle this. We're going to handle this. We won't need you Americans. Didn't work out that way. They're still sitting in Mostar, in, in Mostar trying to settle things that they've not been able to settle for 25 years. Also, it's the period of German unification. Hans-Dietrich Genscher gets very, kind of rat, rather um, um, forthcoming about what he wants. He wants to recognize Slovenia and Croatia. The rest will, you know, don't worry about the rest. And that's what finally, that's what actually over time is what happens. Slovenia and Croatia get into the EU, and we'll see about the rest of the region. Kosovo is not going to be solved by anybody. It is wanted by, you have a 90% Albanian majority, but most of the religious shrines that are the central to Serbian orthodoxy are in Kosovo. Mm. We're not going to settle that one, one way or another. I do think we pushed it too rapidly. I agree with you on that. I don't remember Warren Zerman being, um, frankly, the big player on, on, on Kosovo as much as on Bosnia. He was, remember, he's our last ambassador to the unified Uni Yugoslavia. Mm. And as it became clear, Bosnia was going to be the first place to fight. He was very involved in that. Uh, Warren really is not involved, in my view, as much. It was the, N it was the Bush Jr., Bush 43 NSC, that pushes the time scale, sort of pushes the, 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 the situation on Kosovo um, between February 9, uh, 2006 and the, and the Declaration of Unilateral Independence in February 2008. That was clearly not going to be satisfactory to anybody, as Dayton was not satisfactory. As at Dayton, we pushed it anyway, and here we are. Hmm. So I, uh, I have lived most of my adult life uh, in the period where the, there was a peace declared in the nature versus nurture argument. Mm -hmm. It was really an enforced peace because no one wanted to admit nature. So most of the time when I was growing up, it was the nurture argument. And most of us in this room are practi practitioners of the nurture school. We can work this out. Um, uh, Professor Steven Pinkert, I think at Harvard, did a book called The Blank Slate, where he, in 2010, where he essentially declared the end of this boycott of the nature argument and has asserted that most human behavior is basically genetic. It's basically in the DNA. Uh, subsequently, Nicholas Wade and others have done really innovative work, or some of this is still on the nature of hypothesis, not yet proven, but the assertion is that human evolution didn't stop some 40 or 60 or 80 or 100,000 years ago, that it's happening still, it's happening more rapidly than one might guess. And the Munson conjecture here I'm Al Munson of the Potomac Institute. The Munson conjecture is that any group of people who become either socially isolated 
were geographically isolated, where they are subject to different evolutionary forces, can actually evolve in different directions than other groups that they might be associated with. And that the upshot of this is that we have basic genetic differences amongst lots of these populations that lie at the root cause of the inability to get together. Tribalism, for example, I think is basically, it's not cultural, it goes deeper than that. Misogyny, I think, goes deeper than that. Um, the inability, and this is one of my other favorite causes, and forgive me for going on here, is that the inability to defer retribution for wrongs to a collective body it is at the root of this tit-for-tat business that curses so many of the populations around the world is really of genetic uh, origin and that that unless we can get to the root causes we may not be able to tell which of the situations would be amenable to some of the mo mollification mitigation that we've talked about and which are going to probably have to go the direction of Professor Kanan is that the people are going to have to fight it out at some point because there's no good solution. Yona, can I can I respond? Yeah. Uh, have you read Sapolsky's book Behavior? Mm. I, I, I don't think so. Well, I think you ought to. How, how I think you may revise some of your thinking on this. Uh, <coughs> last year or two. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, it's called Behavior. It's a, and there's a subtitle. He deals exactly with what Pinker has done and others and shows the complexity of this. And so the Moni, uh, you know, the simple explanation here uh, is it just won't stand up, I think. And you may agree after reading the book. Uh, can I, I, I just say that um, the, the problem, uh, one of the many problems <coughs> with your hypothesis is the uh, the brutality of internecine wars and civil wars and wars so so the narcissism of minor differences becomes uh, you know sort of a driver of great cruelty uh, and uh, so by no means is uh, genetic similarity this positing that that is actually a factor uh, any sort of uh, it doesn't get you out of the problem of of brutality and war. Well, since we're doing this, I think actually the comment that Dr. Rich makes supports your hypothesis. That but in, oh. in that, in that, in that, sure. um, whether it's nature or nurture, and I don't know if it's nature or nurture. And the Pinker, the Pinker thesis that Dr. Rich points out has been criticized in, in a num for a number for a number of reasons. Whether it's nature or nurture, we compete. Whether it's over, we always find things to compete over. Whether it's resources, whether it's over uh, sure. um, mate, mates, um, whether it's over ideas whether it's over which of us is smarter or prettier or stronger or what, whatever, we compete. Peace to me is nothing more than the nonviolent management of that competition. Yeah, exactly. Nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. But when you can manage it, it's enough, <coughs> at least for a while. Right. That's uh, right. Let me, let me just add one, one thought here, and that is the very nature that you have a bifurcation here, mm -hmm. I think, is really what is to be questioned. Yeah, right. The interaction between the two uh, in evolutionary terms is really what makes this, gives it the complexity that it has. Yeah, well, uh, I think the, the issues that uh, you, you raised uh, certainly deserve not, uh, not only another seminar, but mm. uh, really to, um, to study it and to see w if we can learn what works and what doesn't work. The, p the point is our, our discussion should be really placed uh, within the context of the so-called 300 years of state system. And um, the message I think that we can send that even, even the United States had to fight a war, not only the revolutionary, but the civil war. Uh, and there are all kinds of uh, signals that uh, indicate that some states want to separate themselves uh, from the federal government, uh, as we know. But um, I, I really believe that uh, the, the key 
to, uh, to our discussion and debate about separatism and self-determination is really how we can strike a balance yeah. uh, between Wilsonian idealism uh, in terms of self-determination and those actually who want to um, maintain the integrity and sovereignty uh, of states. And uh, I'm afraid there are no um, easy uh, answers. And uh, these were the questions that we struggled with going back, uh, what, some uh, 37 years ago. And um, we didn't uh, really reach any definitive uh, conclusion. So this is really a beginning of the discussion. I would like to mention that um, fortunately in the next couple of weeks, uh, we have two distinguished uh, ambassadors, one from the Czech Republic, who will share with us uh, the experience of Czechoslovakia and uh, the <coughs> Czech Republic and the strategic cooperation between the United States uh, and the Czech Republic. And the other distinguished ambassador from Spain who is going to uh, deal with similar issues and uh, whether it's Catalonia or the European Union, and the relations uh, with the US. Uh, the time is uh, uh, ticking and I, I would have to stop at this point to thank the panelists for your contribution, the audience for your involvement, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much.